Hey everyone, Brian Hilbert with Angler's Covey here and coming at you with another Bug of the Month video where we're going to be talking about black fly larvae. So black fly larvae are not as popular of an insect for us to imitate. In fact, most of you watching this video may have never heard of what a black fly larva is. Now black fly larvae are actually in about every piece of moving water across the country. Uh, they often get mistaken for either a midge larva or midge pupa due to their tiny size and they kind of have a worm-like profile. The one distinct giveaway is a black fly larva has a teardrop ab uh, abdomen where their rear end is the fattest part of the fly and it tapers forward to a very distinct black head. We're going to show you today how I like to fish black fly larva, when I like to fish them, how to know if black fly larva are in the waters that you're fishing, and where to look for them. So how do you know if black fly larvae are in your trout waters? So the first place that I would recommend looking is finding any substrate or debris that's on the bottom and picking it up and just looking at it. Black fly larvae tend to latch on to sticks and debris, sometimes rocks, but a lot of the time sticks and debris, and they use silk to attach themselves to allow themselves to anchor and filter bacteria and microbes as they drift downstream to feed. You've probably caught a stick here in Colorado and picked it up and seen all these little wiggling tiny larva looking bugs and probably assumed they were midge larva. If you look close, you'll notice a very fat rear end and a very distinct black head. Those are black fly larvae. If you ever encounter that, you know that black fly larvae are in your trout water. So what time of year do you use black fly larvae? So, black fly larvae for me fall into the category of an opportunistic eat, similar to a leech or a worm or a scud or a crane fly. They're in the water all the time and trout absolutely know what they are. <clears throat> I've caught fish on a black fly larva in every month of the year, but I would say if I had to narrow it down, it's primarily for me a winter and a spring fly. As soon as you start to get some increase in flow in the springtime, a lot of those black fly larvae are getting kicked loose when sticks and debris get dislodged and trout will opportunistically feed on these <clears throat> very voraciously and very selectively. I've taken many throat samples and had trout be absolutely filled with black fly larvae. <clears throat> as far as time of day, I typically am having a black fly larva on my rig whenever I'm not seeing any bugs present or if I'm before or after a hatch. So today we're here in February. We haven't seen any midges flying around, which is the predominant uh, species of insect that trout are gonna be feeding on this time of year. And so this is a great time to tie on a black fly larva and see if we can get a trout to opp opportunistically eat it. Now the other time I'm gonna fish with a black fly larva is any time there's an increase in flows. If your local water is bumped up, you know, uh, uh, any amount or you got recent rainfall, Black fly larvae are a good option to go to that's not as intrusive as like a worm or a stonefly or a crane fly. Um, a lot of our local tailwaters like Cheeseman Canyon and 11 Mile Canyon, the trout are very spooky and sometimes large flies can actually deter them away from your rig. This is a very um, subtle way of presenting a opportunistic food item for them uh, that they won't be so offended to. So real quick, before we uh, get started, I'm gonna take a look and see if we can get a sample from the river so we can closely match our size and color of our black fly larva that we wanna imitate. Now, what I wanna do is look for any type of stick or substrate that is in faster riffly water. Black fly larva really prefer that faster moving water as their filter feeders. They're going to attach themselves to sticks and debris using a silk line <clears throat> so that they're able to sit and catch any kind of uh, microbes or um, small substrate that's drifting in the current to be able to feed. So I see a stick right down here in the water. We're just going to grab this guy and see what we can find on it. I've got a piece of this stick here and I got a couple of good samples that are sitting attached to this.
Now these here are black fly larvae. You can see that they're very, have a very distinct fat abdomen with a black head. These here are about a size 20 or 22. Here's another one right here, it's a little bit bigger one. And they're kind of, there's another one on my middle finger. They're kind of an olive tone in that 20. That one's closer to an 18. But notice the really distinct fat abdomen. So we're going to go to the fly box and see if we can match that. All right, so we took a sample from the stream and we noticed that the black fly larva here on our local tailwater have a little bit of an olive tint to them and they're mostly in size 18 to 22 with kind of 20 being the sweet spot. I really like these Umqua magnet compartment boxes for organizing my small flies. You can see this one's a little chaotic, but I keep most of my black fly larva in the small bottom corners here. What I'm going to do is grab a couple of these in the olive color. Now, black fly larva fly patterns are not exactly readily available. And when I first moved to Colorado, being the bug nerd that I am, I did a lot of research on my local waters and took a lot of sayings and a lot of throw pumps and I found that black fly larvae played a really critical role in a trout's diet. However, I couldn't really find a black fly larva commercially available at the fly shop. So what I did is I came up with my own pattern, which you guys have probably seen in our Bug of the Month tying series for this month, which is Hilbert's black fly larva. If you haven't seen the video, check out the description below and we'll make sure to put a link to it. I do tie these for the shop and they are available for Angler's Covey or from Angler's Covey um, when I'm able to uh, keep up with demand. If you want to get your hands on some of these, I encourage you to get in and because um, they, they do go fast, I will say that. But we're going to tie on these black fly larvae and see if we can find some fish. So how I'm going to set up today for fishing with black fly larvae is really no different than I would rig any other nymph rig. Uh, today I'm going to be using an Orvis Recon 9 foot 5 weight with a floating line, pretty standard. And I'm actually going to walk you guys through fishing with a double indicator rig. This is kind of an old school technique. Um, this was really, really popular about 20 years ago. In fact, this was like the standard when I learned how to fly fish for really wary trout. I'm going to show you guys how we do that and the why behind it. And on my rig, I'm going to fish with a couple of black fly larvae, an olive one and a tan one. And I like to always use when I'm wade fishing a drop shot setup where I'm going to have my weighted fly. In this case, uh, one of my Philly cheese cranes is going to be on the bottom. This is going to get my flies down into the zone on the bottom where the fish are. And uh, we'll see if we can entice anything to eat. Okay, so we're out on one of our local tailwaters today and we're going to fish with some black fly larvae. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit, uh, not just about nymphing with black fly larvae, but I'd like to give you some tips on nymphing as well. And as well, we're going to go over this double indicator rig. <clears throat> so the first thing is going to be the type of water that we're going to start out fishing. We're in a very popular spot. That usually there's always someone in. It's a nice deep pool with a shallow riffle at the top. Now without any obvious insect activity, I'm going to assume that most of those fish are staging in the back of the run and they're patiently waiting for that midge hatch to start. This is where I'm going to be targeting these fish with my black fly larva rig. I'm going to have a relatively deeper rig and a heavy anchor fly that's going to get everything down to the bottom quickly. Okay, so we're in place here and now we're going to start fishing. Real quick, I want to walk you through um, this double indicator rig. Now, <clears throat> the whole point of fishing a double indicator rig is to increase your strike detection and to help you know which way you need to mend. Now, the concept is going to be this. We're going to have two small indicators roughly about five, six inches apart. And while these are floating out on the water, they're going to be moving about whichever way the current takes them. If when I cast out <clears throat> my close indicator, starts to get out ahead of the far indicator, I know I need to mend 
back upstream. And vice versa, if my close indicator starts to sag or fall behind, I know I need to mend downstream. This is a really, really, really good technique. If you're not very good at reading water or maybe you're a little bit new, this is kind of a cheat code that'll show you which way you need to mend. The other thing that's gonna be really nice about this, especially in slow water like we're about to be fishing, is as my rig is floating through that pool, if I get a really subtle take, what's gonna happen is these are gonna change position rather abrupt, abruptly. When a fish takes our fly, especially in the winter time when maybe they're not coming over and grabbing it emphatically, they're just kind of moving over and mouthing it, your indicator won't always go down. In fact, most of the time, what I see is just the indicator pause momentarily and then keep going. This is a strike that a lot of my clients miss, and for good reason, it's hard to read. What this does is you're able to follow those two indicators and it's a pretty obvious change of direction when those fish take your flies and they stop. Now you're also gonna see these go down if the fish hangs on or if he moves over and we're in a little bit faster water and eats them. But in the slower water, you'll notice here today, if these are drifting through and we get a strike, you're gonna see these indicators change position rather quickly. Uh, this is a technique that has been around a long time. Like I said, it was really popular when I started fishing and uh, especially for fish that have a really subtle take in the winter time. Okay, so the one tip I'm gonna give you guys about fishing with a double indicator rig is this rig is gonna be very prone to tangling if we try to do what I call the Brad Pitt cast from River Run Suret, where we go 10 and two over our head and we're trying to work line out like so. Because of the two weight points on our leader there, they almost always will end up wrapping each other up. So what we're gonna to do today is implement either a tension cast or a roll cast. And what I like to do, I'm gonna give you guys kind of a quick summary on it. <clears throat> For the tension cast, we're gonna work out about 12 to 15 feet of line like so. And tension cast, as the name implies, requires tension for it to work. Right now we don't have a lot of tension, we have a lot of slack. So what I wanna do is get all of my flies straightened out downstream below me to where I have tension. I'm gonna accomplish that by pointing my rod upstream and making a big accelerated rainbow up over the top. I'm gonna keep my rod tip low, and I'm gonna pull all this slack out, and I'm gonna repeat that roll cast where I come over the top and accelerate down below. Now that everything is hanging downstream from me, I'm ready to begin my tension cast. I personally like to hold the line between my middle and index finger there as my trigger finger, and the tension cast is basically a three-step cast. Step number one is I'm gonna do a slow lift where I bring this rod high, Think of having your hand, even with the top of your head, almost like your Statue, Statue of Liberty position. One key point here is you want to keep your rod parallel with the river. I'm not going to bring this up really quick, and I'm not going to just point the rod straight up in the air. I want to keep my rod flat, but my hand high. Okay, so step two, I'm gonna, or step one, I'm going to lift. Step two is I'm going to turn my reel upside down like the clond on a hammer. I'm going to point my rod rearward. Think of if straight out is noon for us on a clock, we're going to be pointing back about four or five o'clock. <clears throat> Step three is I want you guys to imagine you have a paintbrush with some paint on it. If you've ever repainted your bathroom or your kitchen and you stuck a paintbrush into a can of paint and you wanted to splatter paint on the wall in front of you, that's going to be the motion. The other analogy I like to give is you had a tomato on a fork and you wanted to fling a tomato across the room at your spouse, that would be the motion. So we're gonna put it all together here. I'm gonna roll my line below me. I'm gonna do that slow lift. I'm gonna turn and point rearward, and I'm gonna throw that tomato out, okay? This completes our tension cast, and it's a very, very good cast for keeping everything straight and in line, and not having to worry about anything behind you if you have brush or anything like that, okay? Okay, so I want to take a moment to talk about mending next. So from our cast, where we're going to lift, turn, and fire, you'll notice my fly line is sagging in between me and those indicators. My near indicator is facing upstream, and my lower indicator is facing downstream. Okay, this is one of those perks that tells me which direction I need to mend. 
if you follow here, if I sit like so and I don't do anything, my indicators are pointing downstream telling me I need to lift and then downstream, okay, to keep those in line. Get my pass here. We're going to mend downstream, basically leading those indicators with our fly line. And the whole goal here, and really anytime you're nymphing, is to make sure that we get a drag free drift. Okay, probably the most important part of fly fishing is to obtain a drag free drift. <clears throat> you see there, that bottom indicator sagged down a little bit. I'm going to set on that. Fly patterns play a very important role in successful nymphing. It is definitely important to have tied on what the trout are wanting to eat. However, I like to believe that trout will always eat the wrong fly presented properly more than the right fly presented poorly. So it's, I really encourage you to focus on your nymphing, your mending, and your casting to allow yourself to get the best presentation possible. Okay, so now that we've covered our cast and our mend, let's talk a little bit about strategy here. Now again, we're kind of mid-morning. It is a little bit of a warmer winter day. I'm really anticipating us seeing some midge activity. However, it hasn't started yet. So, if those fish don't have a pupating or hatching insect that they're going to be feeding on, most of the time I find them in the back of the deeper, slower water. Okay, so we're going to start out targeting this deep slow stuff here at the back and then we'll start to work our way up until we find the fish. So my strategy when I approach a pool like this is I want to start close and work my way out. I really encourage you to live by the rule of being thorough. Okay, Thoroughness is the name of the game anytime that you're going to be nymphing in the winter time. Trout are not going to be very eager to move a great distance to eat a fly. You're going to almost have to hit them in the face. You might do a drift 50 times through a pool and drift number 51 connects. And the reason I think that happens is because those flies were right here instead of right here. I really think this is the game of inches. So when you're out nymphing, especially in the winter, be thorough. The way I like to approach this is I envision the river out in front of me like a chessboard. It's full of one inch by one inch squares. And what I want to do is I want to pass my nymphs and my indicators through every square on the board. Okay. I'm going to start close at about the walking pace current. Um, I refer to ideal trout water as walking pace current. Imagine if you're walking along the bank outside of the water. About the speed that you would walk is the ideal current speed I think trout are looking for. So what I'm going to do is start my drift in this walking pace current on the near side and every cast I'm going to try to go about an inch further across the pool. Okay, that way we're very thoroughly working this. Cast. I'm going to mend downstream. I'm pointing my rod at those indicators and I'm looking for them to change position or the far indicator to dip down. You can see my nymphs are, or my indicators are really trying to go faster than my fly line. I'm going to work all the way through this really slow water. Once it kicks back here, I'm just going to cast again, this time just a little further out. And it's important here that we have our depth set as such that we're ticking the bottom. If you're not sure if you're ticking bottom, deepen up your rig until those indicators are going down about every single drift, and then you can shallow up. Now when I'm nymphing, I like to live by the phrase, set it, don't regret it. I believe in setting the hook and setting the hook often. So when those two indicators change position or dip down or anything happens out of the ordinary, except for them just drifting along, I'm going to set the hook. Now, 
I do believe there is a right and wrong way to set a hook. My personal opinion is to always set low and downstream. The reason we want to do that is the trout are almost always facing upstream. So we want to pull those hooks down into the corner of their mouth as opposed to up or away from them. It also allows us, if we keep the rod low when we set the hook, our flies don't go backwards and get caught in the brush. Oh, that was a fish there. I don't know if you guys could see that on camera, but the bobbers changed position abruptly. I said I had a half a head, head shake there, but, um, but missed him. Even guides miss fish. It's important to realize when we're fishing with small size 20 flies, you're not going to land every single fish. And even though those are barely moving back there, I, I still am getting a decent drift. And trout often in this cold water are going to sit back in some of the slower stuff where they can very effortlessly just kind of exist and wait for that hatch to start. Very thoroughly working that run there and I bet you I did probably 40 or 50 drifts before finally this guy right on the inside that seemingly I'd probably gone through a bunch of times this guy ate it rainbow all right nice rainbow you can see he grabbed that little olive black fly larva thoroughness is the name of the game this time of year okay. all right implemented black fly larva into our system with that double indicator rig in the slow water results in a nice, beautiful rainbow trout. We're gonna let this guy go. All right, everyone, so that concludes our bug of the month video for black fly larva. Hope you guys got a lot out of this video and definitely encourage you to try that double indicator nymphing setup. Uh, definitely makes it a lot easier to know which way you need to mend and detect some of those subtle strikes. If you have any questions on everything we covered here in the video today, be sure to drop them in the comments below. And we'll see you guys next month where we talk about soft tackles.